When I first began ministry, I went to a, a little church, St. John's United Methodist Church, in western, the western part of Oklahoma City. They hired me while I was still in college. God bless them. You know? And I was like a new puppy. They cared for me and loved me and nurtured me and fed me too much pie and too many chocolate cakes. And I thought ministry would always be like that. You know? And then something horrible happened. I got the call to go to seminary. I went to seminary in Dallas, and the bishop assigned me to a church in Dallas. And it would eventually become a great, great church, but not in the beginning. They were fighting. They were fighting a fierce battle about integration and race relationships in their community. The congregation was horribly divided and angry all at each other. And I can remember being in Dallas and, and, and sitting in that sanctuary and feeling so incredibly alone and broken and, and, and just wondering, why did God send me here? And one of the members took pity on me, and, and he brought me a, from a litter of, of hunting dogs he had, a brand new Brittany Spaniel pup. And on the pedigree, it said, Dale's Morning Rose. That was her name. I called her Rosie. And she became my constant companion. If you don't know Brittany's, they're, they're just amazing dogs. They don't really lick, they nuzzle. Oh, I mean, <laughs> if you ever need a friend, that's a dog that'll be your friend. They love to go out so, outside and romp. And I would take her to the, to the parks of Dallas, and we would romp, and I still ran back then. She would run with me, and she was just an amazing, amazing friend. I could tell her my troubles, and she always listened. I had the parsonage right next to the, the sanctuary, and, and, and I was there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, dealing with the problems of that church. I could be with that dog, and it all faded away. And then one night, she got out of her pen. And about 10 o'clock that night, a group of young teenagers called me because she had my phone number on her collar, and she'd been hit on the highway. And I got there just as she died. And I gathered that dog up, and I remember going back to the parsonage with her. And I just said, God, why? God, why did you do this to me? I was happy in Oklahoma City. I had a church that loved me, like that was the most important thing in the world. And now here I am in Dallas, and it's full of Texans. <laughs> and they can't stand me. And the church is angry, and it's every Sunday I just have to talk myself into getting up, getting dressed, and going to worship. I have a friend in the world here, and now, God, you've taken away the one friend I had. Why, God, why? And I was angry. Now, the book of Job is written in part to say that we can be honest with God. If you're angry with God, say it. If you're disappointed with God, say it. If you're dissatisfied with God's job performance and you could point out some ways God could do better, according to the scripture, you get to say that. You are a stockholder in creation. And stockholders get to have and express their opinions to the chief operating officer. Chapter after chapter of Job is about being honest with God. See, the only thing God can't handle from us is our apathy. God can take our joy, God can take our happiness, God can take our sadness, and God can even handle our anger. In fact, in our anger, God recognizes and knows our passion. When we look at the world in which we live and we say things aren't right, people aren't being treated the way they should be treated. Women aren't safe. Children are hungry. There's war after war after war. And we cry out to God in anger about those things. 
God wants to hear it. When we say to God, why do I have cancer? God, how did you let this happen to my loved one? God wants to hear that from us. If you don't believe it, pick up the book of Job. It's in there about six chapters in a row of Job pouring out his anguish and his anger. Blaming God for everything that's happened to him. Now, you remember the first of the story. The things that have happened to Job are not because of God, but because of the evil in the world. But that doesn't matter. Job gets to cry out in anger and be mad at God. There's there's a blessing in that that we're going to uncover over the next few minutes. See, there's something about our vulnerability and our openness that allows God to enter into our lives in a powerful and transforming way. It was a great philosopher, Epicurus, who who originally talked about this problem of, of how can there be a good and just God and also be evil in the world. We have a whole branch of theology and philosophy. That, that, that's all it's focused on. It's called theodicy. The problem of living in the world where you believe that God is good and yet evil exists. And, and, and to put it in, in, in the basic oaky vernacular, why do bad things happen to good people? Right? And there's this whole movement through the Bible to explain that and deal with that topic because it comes to the very core and essence of what it means to be a human being living in this world. Why do pets die? Why do children get cancer? Why are there wars where the innocent suffer? Why does God allow it to happen? Or maybe even worse, Why is God incapable of stopping it? Next weekend, we'll, next Sunday, we'll talk about God's answer to those questions. For today, I just want to stay focused on being able to say that to God, to ask the why question, to even ask it with anger, to cry out to God in the hurt and the brokenness that we all experience and ask why. You see, if you listen to Job's language, and I hope you'll pay very careful attention to it, part of the answer is there. It's interesting to me that in the Western church, among all of us Christians in America and Europe, that that we kind of walk away from the book of Job. But Orthodox Christians, particularly those living in, in the Middle East, When they get to the week before Christmas, I mean the week before Easter, Holy Week, congregations read this part of the Bible aloud three times in one week. It's a recognition that that as human beings, we need to ask those questions. And it's an affirmation that it's okay to ask God why. When you hurt, when you're broken, when your world is shaken, you get to say what's in your heart to God. And not only does God allow that, God longs for that. Great Christian theologian Paul Tillich wrote about it. Tillich wrote at a time when in America, when theologians appeared regularly in Life magazine and Time magazine, and, and people read them every week, and he was once considered the most popular Christian speaker in the world. He had grown up in Germany in the 30s, and he had come out in opposition to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis before they even took power. He had gone from church to church and public venue, one to another, speaking out against Adolf Hitler. And when Hitler finally claimed power, Tillich's friends got him out of Germany at the last minute to save his life, and he he came to America and began to teach as a seminary professor at Union in New York. One series of sermons that he preached was was collected in in a book called Shaking the Foundations. My wife read it when she was young, and it became an important part of 
her spiritual journey. It's an important part of a lot of people's spiritual journey, I think. There's a place in those sermons where, where Tillich is reflecting on his experience of the Holocaust. And he's struggling with how his nation, Germany, how they capitulated to a leader like Adolf Hitler in a way that led to the slaughter of millions of innocent people. And how in the midst of that, he and other Christians and Jewish people and other religious people cried out, where is God? And Tillich said, reflecting on the 42nd chapter of Job that we'll look at next Sunday, Tillich said, there's a place in creation where the foundations of creation itself shake so hard that everything crumbles. And when everything that is finite has crumbled away, only the infinite remains. And it's there that we see God. God doesn't cause those broken places in our life, but in those broken places, in those challenging, heart-wrenching times in our life, God has an appointment with us and a promise to meet us there, to claim us and love us like an angry child that pounds his fist on his mother or father and cries out in anguish. God wraps his arms around us and loves us in the midst of our hurt and our anger and will not let us go. In Job's words we read for today, the great old prophet says, I am reduced to dust and ashes. Now you have to pay careful attention to the language of the Bible because this is incredibly important. It's why millions and millions of Orthodox Christians read this passage every year three times leading up to Easter Sunday. When Job says and cries out, I am dust and ashes, he is saying, I have been reduced to the basic building blocks of creation itself. He's hearkening back to the creation story when when living human beings were created out of the dust and ash of the earth and made alive by God breathing on us. It is in the moment that Job becomes dust and ash that God enters and breathes new life into us, recreates us and makes us new again. The great psychiatrist Carl Jung, reading the Bible, found his faith in this very spot, saying that he believed That it was in this moment when Job cries out in heartbreak, brokenness, and anger that God responds with a decision to offer his son Jesus Christ to the world. God's response to the evil that shatters our lives is to give his son away to bear the burden and the grief and the pain with us to hold our hand as we walk to the tomb and are resurrected into new life when I was a boy I had an aunt named Aunt Mary and I loved her very much she was very very special to me because she worked in a downtown department store That may not seem like a big deal to you, but there was a time when that was a big deal. To be able to get on the bus with your grandma, your mom, or somebody, go to a downtown department store, everybody there was dressed beautifully. And and, and to go in, and my aunt managed a clothing department, and to be able to go in there and to be treated like a prince, 
downtown, that was a big deal. It was incredible. And there was always something to me special about her faith, special about the way she prayed at Thanksgiving, special about the way she loved us. It was never a day in her life I didn't see her without a cross. She just seemed to me to, to be the embodiment of a real Christian faith. And so I was shocked one day when I heard some people talking about my Aunt Mary and describing her as broken. Now, as a little kid, I knew what broken meant. I knew what a broken toy was. It meant it was, it was shattered. You couldn't use it anymore. It meant something bad had happened to it. I knew what it meant when the TV was broken. I didn't get, get, get to watch cartoons till it was fixed. I knew what it meant when the boat motor was broken and my dad handled, handed me a paddle and said we'd have to paddle back. Broken was not a good thing. So I went to my mother, the youngest of 13 in her family, and I asked her, is Aunt Mary broken? And my mother started to tell me about her older sister's life. Mary had grown up with the dream of being a nurse. She had been trained and, and she became a nurse. And when her country was at war, in the war with Korea, she went to war. And she was in an army hospital. I don't think it was anything like the TV show MASH, but that sort of thing. And she was there and the casualties were tough and she was struggling with seeing these, these young soldiers cut down and wounded and dying. And then some of you remember the history. The Chinese suddenly entered the war. And the casualties that were bad became horrific and overwhelming. And my mother said when Aunt Mary came home from the war, she was broken. In fact, I would later find out that, that her solution to that brokenness was alcohol. But I remember how my mother described her life, this life of her older sister she loved and admired so much. She said, your Aunt Mary is not broken. She was broken. But she has been remade. Different, not the same as before, but better. And that is exactly what God does in our life. When we cry out in pain, anger, and anguish, God comes into our life and we are remade, different, not the same as before, but even better. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.